Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm a teacher and author, and this is English Nerd. Today we're continuing the All About Dante's Inferno series with Cantos 9, 10, and 11. The reason that I didn't do two cantos only is that in my class I tend to go pretty quickly through 10 and 11 in particular, and so I'm going to pick out those things that I think are important, but I'm also, just as before, I can't cover everything, and, and I think that these are easy ones to kind of go quickly through compared to the others that establish so much important information. So let's take a look at Dante's Inferno, Canto number nine to begin with. Okay, so last time Virgil and Dante made their way across the Styx, which is also circle five with the wrathful and the sullen. They ran into Filippo Argenti and they arrived at the gate of Dis, which is the gate that separates upper hell from lower hell. It's important to remember that upper hell is characterized by intemperance, or some translations will say incontinence. It's taking a good thing too far without an intention to do wrong. It's, it's more like getting carried away and not stopping yourself from getting too obsessed with something um, in an unhealthy manner. When Virgil and Dante do finally get to lower hell, the rules are going to change. So first, let's get through that gate of Dis. So Virgil gets immediately concerned because he's not able to go through the gate of Dis right away. He can't do it on his own power. Now, Remember, this is an epic poem, yes, but it's also an allegory, and so this is another instance of human reason not being enough to complete the journey of redemption without divine intervention. Divine intervention is a, is a basic part of epic poetry, so it's, it's working on a few different levels here that Virgil really can't get through. He can't do one of his, his nifty tricks. There are lots of demons, fallen angels um, guarding the wall, and we'll find that there is, uh, you know, are even more fearsome creatures as well. So Dante at first asks, hey, have you done this before? Have you gone through this gate? You seem to know a lot of stuff. Um, basically, why can't we get through? And Virgil does say, actually, yeah, there was this other time when I was summoned to get somebody from Circle 9, but that story, it's, it's a little bit unclear what Dante was, was referring to there. You can look at the notes in your translation if you want more information, but it's not something that, that tends to really come up. So in the middle of that conversation, it says, Three hellish and inhuman furies sprang to view, bloodstained and wild. Their limbs and gestures hinted they were women. Belts of greenest hydras wound and wound about their waists, and snakes and horned serpents grew from their heads like matted hair and bound their horrid brows. That is around line 35, 34 and onward in Canto 9. So the furies are also guarding this gate. This has significance for a few reasons. Um, one, mythologically speaking, the Furies are, uh, they pursue the worst of the worst criminals. So those who murder their families and, and break these just cardinal rules. So in that sense, it makes perfect sense that they would be the guardians of lower hell, those who have committed the worst of the worst sins. We also have a very strong connection between the Furies here and how they're described and snakes. There's talk of hydras, of snakes, that's the whole appearance. Um, and in a second they're going to call for Medusa, who of course has those serpents um, coming out of her, her head. So there's a connection to that idea of a serpent, which harkens back to Genesis in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent, who's traditionally thought to be Satan himself. And so all of these things really work together to make this mythological choice for Guardian uh, a, a very intelligent one on a few different levels. Dante, as we know, the poet, loved to synthesize elements from the Bible, from mythology, from all these things that he held in high esteem. So we have the Furies. They 
are going to call for their secret weapon, Medusa, so that they can turn Dante to stone, the stakes are really high here. Because if Dante dies in the Inferno, he stays in the Inferno. His, his redemptive journey has not ended. He has not learned everything that he needs to learn. And so this is a, a pretty terrifying and dramatic moment in, in the story. And we get a, a great Virgil moment here. It's his first mom moment, I would say. He's, he acts like a, a mother to Dante in a few different places, and this is definitely one. So, still in Canto 9, right after the Furies call for Medusa, Virgil says, Turn your back and keep your eyes tight shut, for should the Gorgon come and you look at her, never again would you return to the light. So again, there are the, the high stakes. This was my guide's command. And he turned me about himself and would not trust my hands alone, but with his place on mine held my eyes shut. So Virgil's doing that thing that your mom did when you were younger, when there was something, you know, bad on TV or, or something like that. And Virgil is covering up Dante's eyes because he just doesn't trust that Dante won't look. It's a very sweet moment that shows that Virgil is more than just the embodiment of human reason, but instead he... He has, he is a character, you know, he's a, he's a person on top of that. Okay, so at that moment, it's very dramatic. There's a big sound and divine intervention arrives because that's obviously what they need. They need, they need a miracle and it comes in this kind of strange form. This, this angel floats along over the marsh of the sticks, kind of like, um, you know, Christ walking on, on water. All of the souls are, are terrified looking up at this, this being. Virgil says you ought to bow down. So all of these things are telling us that, that this is clearly a, a divine, a heavenly messenger, as my translation says. But look, look, look at uh, here. Listen to this. This is the description. Uh, line 85 in that neighborhood. It says this, Ah, what scorn breathed from that angel presence. He reached the gate of Dis, and with a wand he waved it open, for there was no resistance. Outcasts of heaven, you twice loathsome crew, he cried upon that terrible sill of hell. How does this insolence still live in you? The scene goes on, but, I mean, if you picture angels, if people picture angels nowadays, you tend to get these kind of, honestly, you get these, wilty looking white people looking kind of sad or you think of a, a guardian angel maybe you know chasing after a car or some other sort of cartoony thing this is not a a picture that most people have in their mind certainly not in the modern era for what an angel would be like um we have this scornful angel so a few things about this scornful angel this attitude of the angel that he doesn't want to be here in hell he is um, disgusted by the souls all around him reinforces the idea that dante's reaction to Filippo argenti in the previous canto was correct because he was mirroring what this divine being feels and so okay that is the correct way to look at these souls in the inferno that's part of what we're getting. Um, there also is that strange uh, wand, you know, he waves a wand and then the, the doors open. It's not meant to be a, like a, a magic wand in the Harry Potter type of sense. It's meant to remind readers of, um, of Mercury's or uh, Mer Mercury's, Mercury or Hermes. Some descriptions in ancient poetry sound a lot like this. So again, it's a, it's a mashup, it's a synthesis of, of the classical and the biblical ideas. Okay, so finally, finally Virgil and Dante are able to go through the Gate of Dis and enter into Lower Hell. So we're in, if you're tracking, Circle 6 at this point. We're going into Circle 6. And the initial view is that there are uneven tombs, it says, that cover this even plane. And 
In a ring around each tomb, great fires raised every wall to a red heat. So these these tombs that are on fire, there's a, a I think it's a pretty famous illustration. It looks like ink and um, there are these souls rising from these burning tombs and it kind of reminds me of of uh, Mickey's Christmas Carol because of, you know highbrow lowbrow I can I can <laughs> deal with it but you know that scene if you watched it as a kid then you know there's the scene where Scrooge McDuck gets almost sucked into hell in you know into that flaming tomb that's the that's the idea except that the tombs are above the ground so Dante can see them this canto ends with Virgil explaining that in circle six, these burning tombs and the souls within them um, are uh, represent heresy. So these are the heretics. Um, specifically, we find out more in the next canto, specifically the heresy, the, the um, unorthodox belief that they, that they um, taught others was that the soul dies with the body. This went directly against the teachings of the Catholic Church and directly against Dante, the poet's beliefs, obviously. And so it was um, considered to be this very dangerous and damaging idea that when you, when you died, there, that there was no afterlife. And understanding that that heresy, that heretical belief in particular is being targeted, um, helps us out with understanding the contrapasso nature of the punishment, how the punishment matches the crime. All right, so that brings us to canto number 10 with the heretics. In class, I tend not to spend a lot of time on this one, but I will just kind of skim across the top, give you some highlights. We do learn some things about the sinners here, but most of what we learn is just reinforced from what we saw before in canto uh, in in circles two and three for example okay so there is there are tons of souls within each one of these tombs even though we're only going to see two of them um, pop up and talk to Dante we learn that there are a lot of them in there so many many heretics um, Kind of cutting to the chase here, the first person that Dante encounters specifically is a man named Farinata. Farinata degli Uberti, I believe is his name. Please forgive me, Italian viewers. <laughs> but um, Farinata was a Ghibelline, and I believe I mentioned this in my introduction. If I didn't, I apologize. But the Ghibellines were the opposing political party to the Guelphs. Um, Dante was a Guelph, and there was this huge power struggle between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines for control of Florence. By the time Dante was in power as a magistrate, it was a Guelph-run city-state. But before that, about 50 years before that, it was just this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Farinata was one of the, the leaders of that Ghibelline faction that kept kicking out the the Guelphs. So Dante had this personal political beef with this guy um, who later was accused of heretical beliefs um, officially by by the people of Florence. So Farinata rises up and he seems scornful. He's, it says in my translation, he seemed to hold all hell in disrespect. We don't meet a ton of people who very openly are scornful against God and, and against hell and against their situation. We meet a few. We meet um, a couple later on. There's Capaneus in Circle 7 and Vani Fucci in Circle 8, but, um, but really not that many. So that's, that's noteworthy. And Dante and Farinata go back and forth about the about Florence and what's going to happen in Florence what did happen in Florence and they're they're both being very catty in the middle of that situation this man named Cavalcanti Cavalcante again I'm sorry <laughs> um, pops up and says wait a second do you is my son with you 
And um, the story behind that is that Dante the poet had a friend named Guido who was actually the, the son of this, this guy who really did live. And so the, the father assumes that Guido died at the same time as Dante. He's assuming that Dante is dead as well. And Dante gets all confused by the question because he was talking just a moment ago to Farinata about the future. And now this guy doesn't even know if his son is alive or dead. So he, um, so the father just gets all distraught, like, oh, he, he must be, he must be dead, my, my son. And he's very sad. Um, but then Dante figures out what was so distracting for him not to answer right away. And that is that the souls can see the future, like we learned with Chiaco in Circle 3, but they can't see what's going on right now. As, as the future becomes the present, everything becomes hazy. So that's why Farinata has information that Dante doesn't have and vice versa, because they only have certain kinds of sight. The, the souls just have this, this twisted, inverted kind of, kind of sight. So that is, I mean, obviously there's a lot more we could, we could talk about here, but I think I'm going to leave it there with Canto 10 and go on to Canto 11. Canto 11 is when Dante and Virgil continue on, but the stench from lower hell coming up from Circle 7 is so horrible that Virgil and Dante have to stop and acclimate themselves before they can go on. The sins and the punishments and the environment is just so toxic and so disgusting that that they can't just plunge in. And Virgil takes the opportunity to explain how the Inferno is organized. The most important points about his his talk are that he explains that Upper Hell is, is characterized by intemperance and he explains also that lower hell is governed by a separate law and that is um, depending on your translation malice or um, intent the intention to harm so you'll you're gonna find frauds down there the violent the the traitors and so it's this intentionality that characterizes lower hell in a way that upper hell um, didn't have so if you even think about circle six the heretics mirroring circle one limbo with the virtuous pagans the people in circle one didn't know about the the laws of god they lived their lives virtuously all that kind of thing the people of circle six according to dante's logic here they they knew better they knew the truth but they chose something else and they gave those ideas to others. There's this intentionality that's lacking in circle one. So those are kind of mirrors of each other. And then um, lower hell proper starts in circle seven, just kind of like upper hell proper started with circle two. So there's a lot of order in this uh, vision of of what hell is. So Virgil explains that the sins get worse and worse and worse as you go down until you reach the traitors in circle nine where the center of the earth is. And we'll get more into that when I get to those cantos, but there's this idea that that you're literally, when you, when you go into Dante's Inferno, you're literally going into the earth. It's a physical place as well as a spiritual place. And the the center of the earth is like the center of gravity is where satan is so people are kind of pulled in that direction which is um poetically very interesting at least virgil goes into a lot more detail that i'm not going to get into now because it's going to become relevant as we actually get to those circles so yeah i think that i think that about does it. So I hope this helped with your studying of Dante's Inferno. I know as with all these videos that there's so much more I could talk about. So um, if you have 
things to add, questions, feel free to put them down below. I'm not going to promise that I'll be able to answer them all, but I will do what I can. So, all right. If you like classic literature, don't forget to pick up Laertes, the Hamlet retelling that just came out recently. It's dark academia-like and amazing, available in ebook, paperback, and hardcover wherever you get your books. So like this video if you like it. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye.